to learn about it. And, um, but also if people choose to get involved that it's more of, you know, an organic approach to that. Um, and Ashley, I love the idea that you uh, are thinking about the youth because that came to mind, particularly with I Got Bridged. So we're excited um, to hear about that today. Thank you, Kant. Sorry, thank you so much, Carol. And um, yeah, we're really um, just grateful to be able to do this with you guys and so grateful for all your efforts um, keeping these conversations going all through the pandemic. Um, a real force of connection through times that seemed um, to be very disconnected. And so that ministry has been really beautiful. Here is Ken, yay, perfect timing. Okay, where is Ken? Now he's he's just he's just joining us, which is awesome. Oh, and um, so um, I'm Ann Williamson. I'm the associate rector at St. John's, and I'd like to add to Ashley's welcome and Carol's welcome, my welcome to you all for being with us for Outside the Box. Um, the name Outside the Box comes from our bishop in the diocese of um, New Hampshire, Rob Hirschfeld who once said at St. John's that you can't keep God's love in a box. So um, that's how we, that's where outside the box comes from. And um, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to hear more about um, Freddie's work with Joyce, his colleague. And um, I've been bridged. I got bridged the other day. <laughs> I think we've all been bridged. <laughs> And uh, even just thinking about this presentation made me think, okay, how can I use this moment in a positive way? And I, I was able to do that. And so thank you for that inspiration, even before I heard all about it. But Ken's told me a little bit, and I'm just gonna introduce Ken now. Ken Hale is a longtime parishioner at St. John's. And um, he um, was sitting next to Sandy Dyka at church That's and awesome. mentioned to her um, what he'd been doing with Freddie and um, I've been bridged and they were like he's like wouldn't this be a good outside the box and Sandy said yes and then Sandy did a huge amount of work to publicize this and thank you Sandy for that great effort so um, I'm going to turn over to Ken he's actually going to do the formal introduction hi I'm here although I don't think you can see me hey Ken we can hear you. We can okay. hear you. Sorry about that. I'm working on the camera, but uh, <laughs> love technology. Anyways, Freddie Patron <laughs> has become a new friend of mine. I first encountered him through my work at Gather, another organization that Outside the Box has supported. My first impression of him was that of an engaging, jovial guy who brought treats from Dunkin' Donuts for the volunteers at the Friday Community Market. Soon after that, he offered me his card. Upon reading his website, which I'm sure you are all familiar with, I was amazed at how much the seemingly happy-go-lucky man had endured and survived with such grace. I didn't even know he was sight impaired at first. Having experienced a couple of similar setbacks that I'm still struggling through, I'm still in awe of Freddie. The good works of I Got Bridge got even more of my attention during the publicity stage of the first walkathon this past September. This event raised money for a 15 passenger van. Freddie's group now offers seniors and disabled community members rides to the food pantry and other locations. My friends and I have already made plans to participate again in the second walkathon. Please share my admiration of Freddie. I welcome him to this special meeting of Outside the Box. Thank you so much, Ken. I, re I really appreciate uh, that introduction. And uh, 
I've been very fond of Ken as well. When I, I went to, uh, I don't know if I should start speaking now, but anyways, I did want to make sure I thanked uh, Ken because uh, I had that uh, crippling fear. I originally went to the food pantry because uh, after being disabled, my, uh, uh, my rent was the, uh, the same as my disability check. So I think you could do the math. And uh, I just had fear going there. And, and uh, he made me feel completely comfortable in regards to uh, showing up. And then uh, kind of just snowballed from, from there. One thing had led to the other and, and you couldn't have made me feel more uh, comfortable. So thank you, Ken. You're welcome. All right, let me start. Oh, okay. <laughs> So I'll uh, keep moving along. Anyways, uh, so, uh, and thank you very much, uh, Sandy, as well, for, for publicizing this and, and making me feel comfortable along the way also. And uh, so, so from what I understand, I'll tell a little bit about uh, myself, and my story, and uh, how, how, uh, how we all, uh, this came to fruition. And um, I usually start off uh, mo most meetings by saying, Freddie, I'm an alcoholic, but this is not that type of meeting. And, uh, but what I will say is uh, I'm, I'm in uh, um, uh, AA, but I certainly do not want to mention AA. That is not uh, the only way to get sober. So I make sure I tell people that it's just how I got sober. And uh, that is not a, the only way, but uh, it's certainly uh, not a program of uh, promotion at all. So I just like to get that out there that I'm not promoting it whatsoever. Anyways, uh, the, what I do like is, is uh, the, for the first time in my life, I've never... Uh, I uh, thought I would ever have it come out of my mouth, but I'm uh, grateful to be an alcoholic and even feels weird to say that. I was thinking about that uh, this morning. And if I wasn't an alcoholic, it's not, I wouldn't be in this position today. And I, I really like uh, that saying in, um, when I hear it in, 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 uh, in AA, it all made sense to me when I heard it, uh, the line, uh, it worked for me until it stopped working. And that's exactly what happened to me. And I continued to make sure it did not work for a long period of time, but uh, that goes without saying. So anyways, as far as uh, uh, my history of it, I uh, went through uh, through college, being uh, you know an alcoholic all those times, that, that was fine. And it uh, just went uh, on and on. And alcohol and drugs are a huge part of uh, uh, my story. And uh, as my sister all well knows that, I think Julie's on here today. And uh, it's a family disease, and uh, it was it, it it continued on and continued on and continued on. And anyways, uh, through all these geographic cures, and uh, uh, that's what we call it, and it just did not work moving around. And when I finally got back, probably about <coughs> excuse me, about probably about five years ago, I grew up in York Beach, and I finally left uh, the last place of. I don't know if you call it residency, but I had finally left uh, Key West. Key West did not help. I was trying to get uh, get well there. And uh, I finally moved to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, saying, you know, as long as I can get some permanent uh, residency, you know, I can finally get a, go to a place I can get my mail, you know. And uh, so when I moved to uh, Portsmouth, uh, things just uh, did not change. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, when I just continued on and then uh, I lost uh, three jobs in four days and this just it just continued on continued on and um, as uh, I went along I, I I knew I was an alcoholic but I just really uh, did not want to do anything about it I just continued on and, and figuring things would change with though and, and and I love that saying nothing changes if nothing changes and as, as I was moving along I ended up uh, realizing I was uh, golfing one day and uh, it's, it's actually funny when, when I saw that little advertisement or, or, or read it when it said smooth, smooth sailing, or, or I can't remember what it, it prefaced, smooth sailing until something happens in, in your life. But I had to laugh because it wasn't particularly smooth sailing. And uh, but in my brain, it was it was smooth sailing, but it truly wasn't in hindsight. But anyways, uh, I was uh, golfing one day and I went to the uh, driving range and, and uh, I didn't see one ball. Usually I'll lose a couple, but all of a sudden I could say to my, I said to myself, something, something's going, going on with my eyes. And so I went to the, uh, to the doctors in Portsmouth and then I went in this machine and then uh, I, I could see at that point, uh, uh, close up at that point, and then I could tell by the lady's eyes. She said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. She said, you better get to uh, uh, Mass Eye and Air. So when I went to uh, Mass Ioneer, they, they just said, you better, you know, uh, basically see as much as you can, as fast as you can. Uh, you know, I have a period of about uh, two to three months of uh, sight left where I'll be able to see shapes, shadows, and uh, silhouettes. And from, from 
that point, I uh, I hate to say it, but uh, not hate to say it, but alcohol did get me through the those those coming months because uh, uh, it was just the, the the fear of what was going to go on and what was happening to me, and uh, it was just at that point uh, my face was disappearing in front of my face in the mirror, and I was you know just that sick in my head that I was said, great, I don't even have to look at my face anymore, and it was just uh, uh, as disturbing as it sounds, it just alcohol did help me get through that point in time in my life. And so as I went on, I ended up going to the doctors for a checkup because I was so physically sick. I was clearly mentally sick due to alcoholism, but I was physically sick as well. I had uh, gout, hepatitis, uh, neuropathy. My legs were like spaghetti. I could just barely walk. And then when I went to the doctors, I had cirrhosis. And uh, it was the beginning stages. And the doctor said either it's full-blown cirrhosis or you have to start drinking. And I said, uh, well, I'll take the cirrhosis. And uh, I don't think it was really a it was really rhetorical question, if anything. But the first words I said was, you know, well, can I drink tonight? And uh, that's all all that matters, as sick as it was. And uh, I moved on uh, from there and just uh, continued to drink. And then by the grace of God, all the miracles started to happen. I went down to my sister Julie's in, in Kentucky for uh, Christmas because I don't fly. So I made my family selfishly. They have to drive me down there, you know. And uh, I went down there with my parents and I was down my sister's for between the, the, the ride down and the, and, and the ride back. It was probably about uh, three, three and a half weeks and I did not have a drop of alcohol. And so on the way back, I figured I had a little bit of clarity. And I said to myself, um, um, when I come back, I just said to myself, uh, with my big ego, I said I had two beautiful wives. I was financially successful. I lived an unbelievable life. I'm just going to drink myself to death. I watched that movie, Live, Leaving Las Vegas, and I said, you know, that's not a bad way to die. And But I convinced myself that it wasn't killing myself. I, I was not committing suicide. I was only going to drink myself to death. And the twisted thinking of an alcoholic, uh, that's the same thing. And I actually, there was a, a newspaper article, and the reporter actually had printed that because only an alcoholic could kind of get the under, understanding of, of uh you know, that is the same you know, thing, thing it's, or excuse me, that it, there's a difference. And I had to explain to the, to, to the uh, uh, newspaper reporter to kind of fix that where, you know, it is killing yourself, drinking yourself to death. And uh, anyways, right when I got back uh, from, from Kentucky, I got a miracle call from uh, Philadelphia at this point in time that said, you need to get to Philadelphia immediately uh, uh, for, for this uh, clinical trial. And uh, so I didn't have a chance to, to, to begin drinking. I got the call from Philadelphia. We went up there and then the lady knew what I was hinting around at when I, I was asking about these, the, the buzzword was uh, liver enzymes at that point in time. That's all I heard in my life being an alcoholic. And uh, she let me know right away. She said, a lot of people have been kicked out of this study due to alcoholism. She said, when they lose their sight, their alcohol uh, use accelerates. So I had all these tests. And then when I came back, I, I made that uh, uh, prayer. And I, I said to myself, if I, if I qualify for this study, I will never drink again. And uh, for, the, for I don't know how or why my liver enzymes went down enough and I qualified for that uh, clinical trial. And somehow, some way they actually got my name in the study. There are three spots left out of 92. The, 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 uh, I, I just the course of events still to this day is, is extremely bizarre and it's an absolute miracle that I actually qualified. And at that point in time, I went to Philadelphia probably, probably about uh, 15 times in that uh, first year. And then going to the uh, study, it was, uh, it was physically demanding. They had to put uh, needles into my eyeballs and then squirt it with like good DNA in hopes that it would attach to the bad DNA and, and and reinvigorate the, 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 my eyesight. And there was hopes that uh, I would be able to have my eyesight back within one year. And I was determined to get my eyesight back. And, it, and they actually said that one, one guy was, uh, one gentleman was driving to the eye study and I was so pumped up. I said, I'm going to drive that guy. And I was determined, I said, I was definitely getting my eyesight back. That's for sure. I knew I was going to get it at the time. And uh, what happened was as that one year benchmark was approaching, uh, nothing was happening with my sight. And uh, all of a sudden it came closer and closer and closer and nothing happened with my sight. But uh, as it failed for my eyesight, I got hooked on AA. So it ended up uh, saving my life and uh, by the grace of God. But uh, when it was, <coughs> excuse me, when it was two months into uh, my eyesight loss, I ended up going to uh, blind school. And uh, as, as far as uh, blind school goes, uh, I went there when it was uh, two months in. And it was 
just an experience uh, like none other uh, between going to blind school and uh, um, uh, probably two, two months in, I was on all these different medications and uh, had a huge resentment, resentment against uh, uh, you know, the psychiatrist at the time. She was like, try these pills, try those pills, try these pills. And I was just all over the place, you know? And they said, try these pills. They make you look pregnant. You can't have sex. It's like, you've got to be kidding me, you know? Could things get any worse? And then, uh, of course, at blind school, every other commercial is an erectile dysfunction commercial, you know? I said, please call the number below. I said, I can't read it. And, uh, but in hindsight, and all joking aside, whether, whether to say that, whether it's a church forum, and I do bring that up because all of those court, all of those things that were happening to me with, with uh, you know, think the things that happened with my body physically for all the medication that, that I was uh, given and I was on, uh, that was God literally just wanting me to have my eyes on the prize, you know, and to keep me absolutely laser focused that, that this whole thing was, uh, was God's plan. It absolutely was. And I, you know, in hindsight, of course, that had created resentments along the way because of, of, of what was happening to me. It was, was one thing after the other, but when I got to blind school, I mean, when I say that part about, it wasn't just that the side effects for the sexual side effects, it was my uh, physical being. And, and I was, uh, had all this weight gain and I was like, looked like I was pregnant and I couldn't tie my shoes. And uh, I was probably all of a sudden, like my, my uh, uh, second second day there and I was gonna leave blind school and I was gonna go to a better blind school, just like all the rehabs I had gone to. I'm gonna go to a better rehab or I'll go to a better blind school. And then the second day there, there was uh, they offered AA there and uh, that's how I ended up staying. There's, uh, just, you know, no coincidences. And uh, AA was just simply borrowing their facilities uh, to have meetings there. So I ended up staying there. But at this point, when I stayed there, I, um, I was still just absolutely uh, out of shape. I couldn't tie my shoes. And uh, I just remember screaming that second day that I was there, like, just screaming. It finally, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I just think about going back to that day. <clears throat> but I started screaming, uh, saying, I'm blind. It finally hit me. I was sober. There's no relief at all. Nothing. And then uh, when I couldn't tie my shoes, all of a sudden, I just, I started saying to myself uh, uh, from that movie, Shawshank Redemption, I remember saying, well, you know, get busy living or get busy dying. And then I'd get pumped up. And then the next morning, I'd say nothing, nothing. And then I'd still feel all depressed from myself and all this self-pity and this went on for a couple of weeks and, uh, and all of a sudden uh, I just screamed up at God and I said, you know, you want some of this guy? You got him. And so I got up, I tied my shoes and at 4.30 in the morning, I started uh, walking and I just started walking, walking. I was just, uh, I didn't know how to use my cane and uh, I was just smashing into trees, hitting my eyes and pummeling through. And so I kept waking up at 4.30. And I just felt so sorry for myself. And I was just determined. I was walking angry. I was like really angry walking, just, just going and going and going. And, 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 I, and I often say this, but it's so true. I mean, you can visit the poor me house, but you can't move in. And, 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 and I locked the doors. And, uh, but as I kept walking and, and walking and walking and walking, and I would come back. And then at 7.30 in the morning after I got back, I'd have to go to classes uh, all day, which, which were just... It was tough, all those uh, classes as well, but uh, uh, all of a sudden I started to kind of weigh myself. I was like 222 pounds and then it didn't work at first. It was similar to my recovery in, in my alcoholism, you know, it gets worse before it gets better. But all of a sudden, I think when it finally hit me, when I started to lose, I don't know, maybe over uh, like 10 pounds after like maybe, maybe a few weeks, it finally started to hit me physically. I said, it's working. And I was just determined on an everyday basis to walk uh, at 4.30 in the morning. Then on weekends, I was walking up toward 22, 23 miles a day. And that's all I did. I felt like Forrest Gump. I just walk, 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 walk. I didn't know what else to do but walk. And uh, as I got out of blind school, I, uh, I was just, just determined along the way to just do it. I was so excited to get back to the seacoast. And I ended up losing uh, 55 pounds. And uh, when I got back to the seacoast, I was walking... I'd say uh, same thing, probably about uh, 20 miles a day. And I uh, continued to uh, walk, walk and walk and walk. And I was going to AA and you're supposed to go to like all these meetings, 90 meetings, 90 days. I was going to like 300 and something in 90 days. I was going to like five meetings a day because I just did not know what to do with myself at all. 
And uh, I was just going completely crazy. I was looking over the bridge saying like, can life get any better than this? I just was euphoric. And like an hour later, I wanted to kill myself. I, my emotions were all over the place. I, and, and so was I. And so I just, just continued on, continued on. And then I ended up um, uh, meeting my uh, now current uh, mentor, sponsor, uh, Dennis. And uh, it was just, it was an absolute miracle. I had gone through all these sponsors because I was so angry and it just wasn't the right fit. And then after I had uh, met, met him, uh, met Dennis, it was, uh, it was unbelievable. It was, uh, uh, he took me to the, through the uh, 12 step process and it was uh, like nothing I've ever been through before. And uh, I could see a lot of people say 12 step process, even for non-alcoholics, it was just an unbelievable experience for me between the damage I had caused the wreckage in my past. And uh, it was just like nothing I've ever experienced before. And, and, and it's amazing what, uh, I get, I've gotten out of life and in AA in the rooms that I was introduced to my uh, spiritual advisor, uh, Nancy, who really took me to another, uh, another level as well. And, and I was just like a sponge reaching for any and all information. And, and I'm certainly not like a, uh, you know, a Bible, big Bible beater by any means or religious this, or I was brought up Catholic and, but I was just so, I was an absolute sponge. I was just reaching out for inf any information I could get. And she was giving me all these assignments, uh, Bible assignments, and I was just doing whatever it took. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. And I remember I was reading, uh, I read audibly to me the uh, different things I was doing audibly. And I remember it was uh, uh, out of uh, Romans 12 too. It was uh, something about the renewal of the transformation of our minds. And I said, that's it. That's it. It's literally what it was for me. It was, was the renewal of the transformation of my mind. I was, uh, I was so sick for, for, for so long, all of this was foreign to me. I was, I was like a, uh, a stranger in my own body. I didn't even, I didn't even know who I was. And, and as an alcoholic, I was absolutely selfish to the absolute core. I mean, I, mean, I wanted to write a book. What about me? And, and, you know, that's where I was in life. And then when I got back and I had gone through that 12 step process, I continued to walk, continued to walk, and uh, I was actually with a friend of mine, uh, Shannon, from, from Roger Williams, where I went to school, and we were sitting there, uh, sitting there on the uh, Memorial Bridge, and uh, it kept going up. I'd get bridged all the time. The bridge kept going up, and then I finally sa I said to her while she was visiting me one day, I said, what do you think of this idea? And then she just said, I absolutely love it, and then not only is it a physical barrier, but a metaphor for life, how to get to the other side. And, you know, so we just decided on, you know, we can just build, do this, we could sell swag, we can do all this stuff, and then we can input the, we kind of didn't know where we we're going to go with it. I said, we're going to help others. Well, how are we going to do it? I have no idea. And uh, that's kind of how it was formed. And, and the first thing we did was uh, uh, we made uh, masks because during the heat of COVID, and, and I remember going up to all the cars that were parked because the bridge went up and I was asking them, y'all, would you like to, would you like to buy a mask? Would you like to buy a mask? And then some lady finally came up to me and said, sir, I hate to tell you, I think all their windows are open, you know, cause I can't see. And uh, so it just kind of, you know, snowballed from there. We, we uh, uh, continued to sell the masks and, and t-shirts and now we're in all the, the uh, convenience stores. And uh, at that point in time, it was, uh, I believe it was uh, uh, last year where, uh, I knew I could do something. We had to just get it to another level a little bit in regards to helping others. Like, well, what can I do? Especially with my vision loss, I can't use a computer and um, it speaks out loud to me, but as far as like, what can I do to help others? So I knew I could uh, shovel, that's for sure. And I can see the mailbox. So I, uh, we printed 5,000 flyers and I walked all along uh, uh, Portsmouth, all the residencies that I could walk to. And I put in flyers and then all of a sudden we started getting phone calls. And it was uh, like the most unbelievable experience where the phone call started to, uh, to pour in. And then all of a sudden we started uh, shoveling. And then my friend, uh, uh, Jim, actually, he was the first one to uh, help me, to jumped up and helped me shovel. And all of a sudden we're like shoveling th this uh, lady's place. We're shoveling and I had, Jim's a friend of mine and I had no idea about his disability. And he's like, letting me know that he said, uh, be careful because I, I can't see. I'm throwing snow in Jim's face. He's going around. He told me he's a, a hemiplegic. I said, a hemi what? I didn't even know. I never heard that before. And so he's going, he's going around. And he's, I said, we're going to be shoveling around in circles while I'm throwing snow in your face all day, you know? And all of a sudden, that's where it is. The exact instance of what I'm saying is that an example where, where, 
we're laughing the whole time we're doing that. We're, we're, we're helping this lady out. We're shoveling her out. And you know how many times we thought of ourselves? Not once, zero, the whole day. And I continue to always, always say this and in, 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 without trying to preach it, but we can help. I truly believe I can help myself out of any self-pity, whether it's, uh, you know, a love of a, of a past one or, or a crumb on the floor. I mean, anything. And I truly believe that. And um, I'd just like to bring up while well, I'm thinking of it, whether it's out of sequence or not, it always reminds me of a dear friend, uh, Diane, Ch excuse me, had di Diana. So during the heat of COVID, her, her son had uh, died along with her brother and uh, all, all within one month. I mean, absolute devastation. You don't figure it could get any worse. And she didn't know what to do with herself. And then I remember her, she, she was speaking and it just resonated with me just so much when, when her spouse says, you got to go help someone. She said, help somebody, you know, just could not believe that's even coming out of her sponsor's mouth. But then the next thing you know, she reached her hand out and then she was helping another woman. And she says the same thing. I mean, we have like always, always just, uh, she became a dear friend to me when I met her at a meeting one time. And just, that's always just takes us outside of ourselves and, that's exactly how she got out of uh, that particular situation at that time. I mean, you know, within a month's time, her brother and her uh, her son to pass away just like that. And that's exactly what she did was, uh, you know, uh, reach out and start to help others. So that's always something that resonates with me. But uh, at that time, uh, Jim and I, we just continued to uh, start uh, shoveling. And then other people came aboard. My friend uh, Ben came aboard as well. And uh, we continued to uh, shovel for people. And uh, that's really how kind of it was born as far as uh, I got bridged. And uh, it's basically, you know, as far as I got bridged, how are we going to get to the other side? How, how are we going to get unstuck? I mean, it's, it's basically, you know, the G-rated version is you got dealt a bad hand. What are you going to do about it? And uh, as far as uh, that goes, we continue to uh, shovel. And as uh, time progressed, and with the help of uh, my family, my family was uh, huge as far as starting I got, I got bridged. And as we uh, moved along, family and friends came along. And uh, as uh, the shoveling uh, subsided, we decided we're going to do a, a first annual walkathon, which we have now renamed uh, Bridgeathon. And uh, as things uh, continued along, we were just uh, collecting raffle prizes. I was uh, on foot collecting a lot of raffle prizes as, as the days progressed. And I collected probably, uh, I think it was about $30,000 in, in raffle prizes. And uh, that's all the things that I can do. But uh, due to my vision, I really can't uh, do much. And, and my sister is responsible for uh, Julie. I think she's on here. She sends out the inspirational quotes to jumpstart the day every single day on Instagram and Facebook, which is a, a huge help. And people really uh, warms, warms my heart when people bring up how much those uh, quotes really help them on a daily basis. But as far as that goes, we continue to uh, just uh, trudge along. And, and it was great. And I was collecting prizes after prizes and things were great. But then all of a sudden, I needed some uh, some some help to get to to get us to where we wanted to be for that uh, first annual Bridgeathon, and that's when I had uh, bumped into Joyce, and we we're in the uh, Market Square, we we're we we're uh, talking there, and then Joyce had said, uh, "Well, you know, we're talking back and forth," and she said, "I'm actually looking to volunteer." I said, "Really?" I said, "Well, we have a nonprofit," and it was um, a perfect match as far as that goes because uh, at that point, I considered her an IT expert. And but she's definitely uh, has helped take uh, I got bridge to the next level because she was able to reach out to all the people that we weren't able to, uh, because believe it or not, you need to use technology in order to get to where we want to go, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, sponsors that uh, came on board and um, all of that. You just you just had to. There, there's no other other way about it, because especially with my vision, uh, you have to ask for help without a doubt. I think everybody in life. Uh, uh, needs to ask for help. And a lot of people, I can only speak for myself, but uh, especially whether it be an AA or anything else, the number one thing in life for me is to, at this point in time, especially with my vision, is, is uh, uh, asking for help. And uh, uh, we just uh, started to move right along. Uh, we just, uh, uh, just put the pedal to the metal and uh, we got to, uh, it's many sponsors that came aboard. And then as the um, uh, Bridgeton approach that went off uh, really without a hitch. We just we were working dead morning, noon, and night on this, and uh, 
um, with the help of all the family and friends that went off and uh, gather, can and gather and a uh, bunch of uh, supporters, Marie, who I believe was on it. I mean, so many people came out to the bridge and we could not have been more happy. It went perfect, a beautiful day. Couldn't, couldn't ask for anything, anything more. And uh, the goal was reached of uh, $15,000 uh, in order to start looking for a, a van, which we now call uh, the Bridgemobile. But at that point in time, I kind of had in my head, yeah, maybe like Portsmouth Ford could donate a van. And it's like, well, no, that's not going to happen. We, you know, we started to try. But then I started calling all the uh, people that uh, had won uh, prizes in the uh, raffle. And every single person, I kept asking them, hey, if you know of a van, and then someone from uh, AA had said, I think I saw a van in the side of the road in Salisbury. And uh, so I called that gentleman and then uh, one thing led to the other. And he, uh, he had explained to us um, that, uh, well, I tried starting a nonprofit two years ago and I was in over my head. There's so much work. He said, I threw my hands up. He said, I can't do it. I said, well, we're a nonprofit. And it was perfect. It was, uh, we went down there and it was like uh, absolute mint condition, uh, 15 passenger van and then we purchased uh, the van and then we uh, just uh, got all the logos all over it. We have uh, uh, our sponsors uh, with the, the uh, it's just, it's we've just, 10 drivers. yeah, we've got um, more than 10. We have uh, up to 15, 15 volunteer drivers. As of yesterday, we're up to uh, 15 volunteer drivers. My spiritual advisor is uh, Nancy, her husband, Russ, uh, he just drove last week. And uh, the beauty of it is the, all of the uh, community getting involved together. We've actually, we've created a, a, a platform uh, where we're we, like, originally when, when I had heard someone say like, oh, people want to volunteer, they just don't know how. I didn't agree with that, but now I couldn't agree with that anymore because there's so many people out there that would like to volunteer, but they just, they don't know how. And uh, we've created a platform in, in regards to them jumping on board. And the beauty of, the whole thing with I Got Bridge and people volunteering and getting outside of ourselves is that it's we know the people that we're helping, the elderly and people in need. That goes without saying. But the beauty is the people that are helping them, they're getting outside themselves. Uh, um, and the, the database is getting bigger and bigger and bigger uh, where people have been consistently reaching out to us uh, for help. Even last week, um, it was uh, Peer Connections. We've uh, hooked up with them really, really well. We're if there's certain people that they can't help, they refer them to us. And even last week, we got a few calls from them, and we were able to help a few different ladies last week. And matter of fact, uh, my friend Marie, I believe, was on here. I reached out to her. We got a call from Peer Connections. We got called uh, or looked up our database. Marie just uh, volunteered the day before. We put her to work right away. And uh, all of a sudden, within a matter of like minutes, she jumped in her car. She went over to, to, to this lady's uh, motel, brought her to the food pantry. I, I was... Uh, out of town that particular day. And then I was able to call Hannaford. We had a, a gift certificate waiting for her at the front desk and it happened just that quickly. And it's just so exciting. And the best part about it was to hear Marie right after helping her say, oh my God, the same thing as I've been saying. I didn't think of myself all day. It's the best part. It's, 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 it's the, that's the best part of the, the whole entire uh, process. And it's just been like evolving and evolving and evolving. We've actually even just came up with a, uh, a little uh, offshoot of uh, I got bridged where as far as getting bridged uh, is so, uh, so after we met Joyce, we all uh, the people that were working with Joyce, we kind of nicknamed uh, Joyce Joy. And then she was going through over her uh, obstacle in life at the time. And then so as a joke, we were kind of saying, hey, time for joy. But then all of a sudden, as far as uh, I got bridged, we're saying, well, what happens when you get over your bridge? What happens when you finally get unstuck and get over your bridge? Well, what time is it then? Well, it's time for joy. And so not only is it her time for joy, it's everybody's time for joy. So then we actually registered our uh, a trademark. We ran out, registered the trademark time for joy. And then uh, hence, after time for joy, we've got actually have our, uh, we're going to have two main events per year. We're going to have the Bridgethon, which is 9-11 uh, this year on September 11th. And then this coming March 31st, Thursday, March 31st, uh, at 6.30 p.m., we're going to have a silent auction, and then right after that, we're going to have a, a stand-up comedy night. So it'll be our second main event per year. It's going to be our first annual uh, stand-up comedy event, Time for Joy comedy event. And uh, and it's funny. It's, it, it All of it comes together as far as like that that um, Time for Joy, because as far as working on, on ourselves and, and, and uh, you know, getting over our, our bridge, I mean, we still have to have, I couldn't say we, I, or whatever we, we do, we have to have that balance. We have to, you know, 
actually be able to finally like enjoy ourselves at, at one point. And, you know, when I, we have to, we have to work on ourselves. That's for sure. We have to, for me, I have to, I have to pray in the morning. I have to meditate. I have to help others. But, you know, my time for joy, that may be a walk on the beach. I still have to have that balance to take a breath, to stand on that bridge, the Memorial Bridge, and I can feel the, the, the sun just bouncing off the, off the ocean and, and, and I can feel it inside me. And that's, you know, that, that's my time for joy, but it's all the work that I have to do throughout the day. And the beauty is when it becomes part of that, uh, that routine, I was just speaking with uh, my, my uh, spiritual advisor last month. And uh, when, when I was referencing the word threshold, she said, stop right there. She said, I love that word, word threshold because it's so funny. It's, it's, you can't believe so many times people will, will, will say, Freddie, can you give me something to do? I want to volunteer. All of a sudden they'll help volunteer and they say, Freddie, that felt so good. I can't wait to not do it again. And this is the, the human brain, it's human nature to just not want to do it again. You know, it felt so good that they don't want to do it again. But then to get over that, that uh, particular threshold, that's the hard part. So it's to, to do it initially, but then after that, to make it part of our routine, in, you know, which I refer to as, you know, kind of like doing the drill and just make it part of that, that routine as, as far as, so if, if I make that part of my routine, helping others along the way, as I continue to make it part of my drill, I consistently don't have to uh, have any of that self-pity. Whereas I don't want to just try to help others as much as I can fall back into that self-pity, then have to climb my way back out again. If I just consistently, consistently make it part of my routine, helping others. Not expecting anything in return. Right? Yeah, that's the key is expecting zero in return. That was a process for myself was, uh, uh, it was so foreign to me that uh, I was actually uh, helping others. And like I said, I was so selfish to the core, but what instilled in me from, from my, my mentor, Dennis, about helping others is the whole key to life. And when I was doing it, and I'm not blaming myself for doing it wrong, I never even would even think of doing it. Why would I help them if I need the help? So when I was helping them, I was expecting something in return. They weren't thanking me the right way, which I was getting frustrated over. And uh, but it wasn't until I finally, finally expected zero in return, it actually came back tenfold. And uh, uh, I know it kind of resonates with me now. It took a long, long time, um, 48 now. But when I was a little kid, my mother always would instill in me, uh, do good, do good things, good things happen. And I never even just, it just, oh, okay, okay, okay. Now it really just resonates with me. And uh, without expecting anything in return as far as good things happen. And um, that, that little thing when expecting zero in return. So when I was trying to go through that process at, at the beginning when, when Dennis had told me that was, I finally found a way there was some workers around Portsmouth and then there was uh, uh, some, some uh, people doing something with the lights and I ended up uh, purchasing popsicles at the, the convenience store and I was just giving them popsicles and then just taking off as fast as I could. And uh, it finally worked because there's no way they were going to chase me down to, to thoroughly thank me for the popsicle I gave them. So anyways, it was a small little exercise for myself that for the first time, uh, I didn't expect anything in return. And it was a small example, but it was you know huge for me that actually... I said, and I was going through a rough day that day about nothing, of course. And uh, when I finally was giving all these popsicles away, I said, that just felt so good. And I wasn't expecting anything in return. And I didn't think of myself once. It was just uh, just that simple. And uh, and it was pretty much free. I mean, it didn't cost me much at all. And uh, as far as uh, speaking of free, the high that I get from uh, from helping others, that's for free. And, and there's no withdrawal. That's the best part. And uh, that's really how uh, all of uh, how I got bridged was uh, was born. And it just continues to, to uh, uh, just snowball, no pun intended with the shoveling. But not only that, we're installing brand new air conditioners for uh, the elderly and people in need in the summer. And people come to us with some ideas. And a lot of the ideas hit us on the bridge. I was walking on the bridge when the idea hit me for the bridge mobile. And uh, I could literally feel the hair stand up on my skin. It was, it was just, I could feel God inside of me. I mean, God was always with me, but I was doing no business with him, with him for years. And uh, it's just un, like the most incredible experience uh, of my life. The people that are getting involved. That, that, that's the feeling that I get inside is the people that are getting involved and, and they're coming back to me saying that felt really, really good. 
And then what I had said before about people saying, I can't wait to not do it again. Now, Marie, for instance, she just called me and said, can I do it again? So it's starting to work and it's in, in it, we're starting to get to where we want to go with it. And about the code drive a little bit, Lisa, you said. Oh yeah, good. You can. No, go ahead. Yeah. So we also had uh, the code drive from uh, at uh, FISA at the, the public housing. And uh, we had about, I think it was about 190 coats and uh, maybe yeah. a three hour period. And uh, there's a, a lady that uh, lives there, Lisa. She's one of the residents there. And uh, it's just, she got involved and it really gave her a, a sense of purpose. And um, so we're kind of doing doing things, whatever we can for 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 whoever's in need. And the one thing about the coat drive is we were we were missing like a three XL women's and, and a two XL for men's. And somebody reached out to us asking if we had those size coats because he did, he and his wife did not have a winter coat. So we couldn't find one. So um, thankfully next door, that app has been wonderful to bring the community together. And I posted uh, an ad on next door for a three X and a two X and immediately we got about two or three, four hits. We were able to get some coats for the people in need. So again, bridging the gap, people that actually need help and people that have help to give, it's been a phenomenal way to really bridge the gap and bring the community together. So as we continue to do these little things, more things keep happening with the charity. I was just wondering if you should pause and see if anybody has any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Are Thank there any questions of anyone? I mean, it, 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 um, it's, Brittany, it's absolutely incredible to hear what you've done and the journey you've been on. You're, you're a, a wonderful example to us all. What would you say is the greatest need that you are unable to fulfill at the moment? The, 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 thank you for bringing up the biggest, the biggest need uh, we've started to fill was uh, just constantly, uh, consistently reaching out, for example, Safe Harbor uh, Recovery down on Islington Street. <clears throat> we just, uh, we uh, consistently, we stuff uh, backpacks full of uh, life essentials and toiletries. We keep sleeping bags there for, so for the homeless to just grab and go. So and, uh, tents are on their way too for the homeless. So they can just uh, stop by Safe Harbor, grab and go. And um you know, speaking of the homeless, uh, we've got a great partnership with uh, Crossroads where we're in the middle of shoveling. And then uh, Joy and I were, were shoveling. And we got a call from Crossroads and then we just uh, jumped right to it. And we had to uh, take the Bridgemobile over to Dover and pick these uh, these women up in order to get them back to uh, Crossroads because they were staying in a hotel due to uh, being able to had to quarantine for COVID. But as far as uh, that's something we're really tapping into is, is uh, the homeless. We really didn't realize uh, the severity of, of the homelessness around our community. And, uh, you know, if, if that, that, that's the beauty of where we are right now is this, uh, we have such an open line of communications. And I'll tell you what we love the most is if someone presents us with an idea, we'd love for you to have the solution. <laughs> No, I'm and I think a lot of people just have some basic needs. Like we just heard from a woman and her mother recently died, but her mother's friends have just, who's, she's in public housing. She just, she has a need for like medical supplies and groceries and, a, you know, a walker, you know, things like this that they can't have access to or can't get access to. So um, just, you know, things like that, that just come up out of nowhere. Like Freddie and I are like, how can we help this person? How can we find this need that this person has. One homeless woman, she has a missing tooth. She's looking for a dentist that will help her fix her, her tooth. And she doesn't have insurance. And she's asking us, do you guys know of a dentist in the area that would be willing to help me with my tooth? So little things like that, that a lot of times they just go unnoticed. And if we can help bridge that gap by finding that resource for that person, it just goes a long way for a lot of people. Thank you. Carol, you sent me a question. Would you like to just unmute and, and um, ask? It may have morphed a little bit since you asked it earlier. Well, yes, yeah, some of it was answered, but um, can you give some more examples of how the van is used? I've seen it parked along Middle Street, so um, I'm always curious about that. Yeah, I'm so, so glad you brought that up. Right up until uh, last night, actually, and uh, Joy and I were saying how we're going to put it to more use. So. Literally, we uh, prayed on it the night before, continued to pray on it right up until last night. And then last night, we get a call from someone from the uh, Crumple Center, which is a, uh, they deal with uh, brain injuries, and they're, they're a wonderful center, uh, the Crumple Center. So now uh, the Bridgemobile, the van, 
they will we'll be using that to pick up uh, the people with brain injuries. And uh, like I said, my friend Jim, who has a brain injury, but he's ready and able and willing to drive. So now he's going to take him outside of himself while they have all the fellowship and camaraderie picking up everyone over for the uh, Crumple Center that uh, that needs a ride. And what we have also done is uh, taken the uh, folks from uh, families out from Crossroads, for instance, we took them to a uh, Festival of the Lights at uh, Wentworth by the Sea. And then we took them for dinner after uh, the Festival of Lights. And it really just took them outside of themselves um, for the evening, as well as myself and my friend Ben, who drove. And all of a sudden for us to get that excited, um, you know, to actually be able to do that for for uh, for people and and we would love to use that van more. So if you have any ideas, especially you know for St. John's, if you want to use the van or have us drive, you know, a group of people somewhere, please let us know because we do need to get that van working for the community. We we're truly trying to maximize uh, the van. It's 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 just a perfect opportunity to whether it be to go on some excursions or not. And uh, so the van as of now on Friday, what we do. 9.45 a.m. we pick the people up at uh, Margison, 10 p.m. over at uh, Feaster, and then 10.10 we go over to uh, the O'Keefe building, and then at 10.20 we pick them up at uh, Portsmouth Apartments. We take them over to the uh, Gather Food Pantry, and then from there we go to our Walmart, and then Hannaford or Market Basket, or both. I have to say, it sounds to me like you could use a little group of able-bodied teenagers to do some shoveling and yard work and lifting and pulling oh, and placing. And we have a lovely group um, of youth here that really show up to serve. And we have built into our programs uh, recurring service opportunities. We have a partnership um, with Crossroads House and... Um, some other places as well that you've mentioned. And so it's just, it's really exciting um, to hear how you're kind of gathering and harnessing um, those needs and, and using your platform to, to make that those connections. Because I think for so many people that is the hardest part is just finding those that are in need in a way that we can really serve them. Um, That's very true. And all the proceeds that we receive, we, we do get donations, we have some sponsors, but everything goes back into the charity, you know, to support the Bridgemobile, buy gas, pay insurance, you know, stock the care packages, everything. And, so. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's what I was going to say. That the care packages, if anybody knows of anyone now, we send out about 15 care packages a week. And mm -hmm. uh, those consist of uh, Kilwins, Fudge, Port City Pretzels. Uh, kind granola bars, uh, lint chocolate, seasonal products for, for women or men, chapstick. Uh, uh, we put in a winter, I got bridged hat. Uh, so if anyone knows of anyone, we send those out totally free of charge. Uh, we are 501c3 and uh, we send those out totally free of charge. Predominantly keep things on the, the care packages on the seacoast, but we do send those out nationwide as well. And um, as far as speaking of getting the community involved, it's uh, when you said youth ministries, it uh, reminded me, we had a great community night. Flatbread is superb with the community and they provide us with pizza for all the volunteers after every snowstorm. And we just had a community night where we got a portion of their proceeds uh, last Wednesday. And uh, we had a big banner, a three foot by three foot banner. And we brought that up to uh, Little Harbor School for the students to, uh, to uh, paint that with all the crayons. And uh, the, so now they're heavily involved, uh, the students at Little Harbor School. So they're currently doing all Valentine's Day cards, which we're now going to disperse to all the uh, elderly for the Valentine's Day cards made by the students this week. And also, if anybody, sorry to go on, but I, before I forget, if anybody knows of anybody that needs a, uh, a haircut, Paul Mitchell has uh, stepped up, Paul Mitchell uh, Hair Salon downtown, and they now cut here for free for I Got Bridge. So uh, I Got Bridge reconciles the, uh, the bill at the end of every month. And so if anybody you know, if anybody need of a haircut, it's completely for free. All you have to do is reference, I got bridge and the haircut's for free. I do have a question about, um, I love the idea of the, the bridge mobile taking folks to the pantry. It's kind of like all, the, and that whole idea of bridging the gap is just awesome. Um, how does, what is the mechanism for someone to know, like who's at Margison or at Feaster or something to know how they can get into, you know, how can they get a, how can they get a ride? How does that work? 
the sort so of what, practicalities. Oh, sorry. So what they do is there's a sign at all the common common areas at those uh, four public housing, and besides the the signage, what they also do, and this is at least for Feaster and Margeson, they actually make a telephone call every Thursday and let them know to remind them what time uh, they'll they will be picked up as a reminder. And then they'll also let them know in case uh, something may happen, if there's any type of cancellation, uh, whether it be due to weather or inclement weather, for instance, last week during that uh, severe storm, they also let them know that they'd be uh, canceling. But uh, yeah, things are, are uh, really ramping up. So that's how we are disperse, dispersing those phone calls is, is through the, uh, the main office on those two. And then uh, it, actually from the signages that uh, we put up at O'Keefe and Portsmouth Apartments, we've already received uh, phone calls. And then upon cancellations, it's so great. Uh, there was a lady at uh, O'Keefe that saw our sign. We were going to pick her up and uh, she couldn't go the week before because she was sick. And then um, it was canceled. When Ken gave me a call, let me know it was canceled because the weather was so severe. And while we were shoveling, my mother asked me if I needed anything at Market Best. And I said, I don't, but the lady in, in, in room such and such over at O'Keefe and then my mother showed up and surprised her with all these groceries and she just called us up crying. She said she was pacing her floor because she did not know uh, where her next meal was going to come from. And then my mother showed up and then all of a sudden my mother was happier than that lady. <laughs> it's exactly how it works. Well, it's 1255 and this has been a wonderful time. If there's anybody that thinks of any other questions um, that they'd like to ask before we wrap it up, um, now would be a great time for that. And Freddie and Joyce, if you think of any last last um, wonderings or, or blessings for us as we go off and, and depart and um, think about how we, um, how we serve in our communities, et cetera, please go ahead. And just a reminder, not necessarily to promote, but I guess it is, as far as the uh, Time for Joy comedy night with the five, five stand-up comedians, you would just go to igotbridge.com, then go to the events, and it's Thursday, March 31st, and it's $44 a ticket, includes complimentary food and beverage and unbelievable prizes uh, for the silent auction. And what better way to help others than to laugh all night, right? Amen. Freddie, could you just give us your phone number or the best way to contact you again? We can't hear it enough. Absolutely. It's a 866 bridged, which is 866 274 3433. You say it one more time. Sure. 866 274 3433. 866 bridged. Or his email address is freddie at igotbridge.com. Brilliant. You are very inspiring, both of you. Thank you so much for having us. Yes. Thank and you. also, the other thing is, if, if people haven't, I'm sorry to leave you with this. My sister Julie's on here. She's responsible for those uh, inspirational quotes every day. If you like the page, I got bridged on Instagram or Facebook. We send out an inspirational quote to jumpstart the day every day, and it, it keeps you abreast of what we're doing with the community as well. Thank you. We also have on the website a place to volunteer. So if you, there's two, two forms to fill out, people that need help or looking for help, and then people that want to help. So we are getting a lot of inbound forms coming from volunteers and also people that need help. So if you wanna check that out too, by all means, feel free. And you were saying earlier that, you know, your general area of operation is the seacoast. So could you, what, what does that mean? <laughs> Actually, we're trying to figure out what the seacoast is. We know it's a little bit of a gray area. So we just dipped into uh, called the Link House, which is in Newburyport, Massachusetts. And we dropped off uh, 20 care packages to the gentleman in, in, in that house, in the Link House, which is uh, uh, all toiletries, life essentials, uh, hats, gloves, mittens, all that, uh, all those type of things. So we go down to Newburyport and then we go uh, as far up as uh, we passed York. We did some work into even Kennebunkport, but uh, so our primary focus right now, though, for picking up uh, for the food pantry just for now is uh, Portsmouth in, Kitt in Kittery. But as far as those four public housing, uh, picking up for uh, the gathered food pantry uh, just just for now. But as far as using that Bridgemobile Seacoast, 
we we were really wanting to uh, expand. So that's why if you had any ideas of how we could really utilize the bridge mobile, please uh, get in touch with us. And we do quite a bit of work in Kittery as well. Well, it's been absolutely wonderful to have you with us and so inspiring and um, just thank you. Thank you for sharing the story. So it's just so, so honestly sharing your story, Freddie, of, of, you know, you said something earlier about just that sense that all that has been is of God somehow in some inexplicable way <laughs> that, you know, um, and so I just really appreciate your honesty and just this amazing work that you're doing. And thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Sandy and Ken. Really appreciate uh, all your help. <laughs> all right, friends, I'm going to stop recording.